near end. Uh, core accessibility, building inclusivity into the Drupal project. Um, welcome to our panel. Uh, we're, today we're gonna cover some basics of accessibility, just so we're all on the same page. Um, what it is, why we need it, um, some great just general accessibility features found in Drupal 8 core already, some initiatives that we're working on, and how you, the audience member, can get involved. Uh, here are the speakers. Uh, myself, I'm from Hook42. My name is Carrie Fisher. We have Mike Gifford down there uh, from Open Concept, Helena McCabe from Lullabot, and Catherine uh, McNally from Phase 2. And if you need to contact us, uh, that's our uh, drupal.org. Um, information and then our Twitter information. All right, so Helena's up first. Hi. <laughs> so I'm going to kick us off here um, with what accessibility is and why Drupal needs it. So at the heart of it, web accessibility is pretty simple. It's about building websites with the necessary accommodations so that people with disabilities can use them easily. As I explained to a client once, web accessibility is like the wheelchair ramp at a store, but for websites. It's not a thrill, or not, <laughs> yeah. It's not a frill, it's a quality issue, and it's especially important to our Drupal community. As we go through this high-level overview on the accessibility basics, so bear with me if it's something you already knew, but we're just kind of I'm gonna layer on the first you know, FYI, and then I'll go into the deeper stuff. Um, and I'm gonna explain why that is. So there are a few different types of people who benefit mainly from web accessibility, and that is the visually impaired. Um, those are people who might have trouble distinguishing between colors, viewing content without enough contrast, or they might not be able to see at all. We also have deaf and hard of hearing users, and they may have trouble understanding content that is poorly captioned or not captioned at all. Uh, they benefit from a chat option instead of having to call in, so that's always a good thing to do. We also have users who are motor impaired. Those are people who have fine or gross motor problems. That could be anything from a tremor from Parkinson's to being paralyzed from the neck down, anything that makes it difficult to use a mouse. Uh, we also have people with vestibular issues and seizures, and these issues are extremely important and often overlooked. Um, they're one of the most direct ways that a poorly built website can physically harm our users. So it's really important to be mindful of these. Um, I know Parallax was all the rage a few years ago. A lot of companies still really like it. Designers are really fond of it. Um, but people with vestibular issues can get motion sickness from those types of event uh, effects. So it's really, really good to be sparing with them um, if you use them at all. And websites with fast, bright, flashing effects uh, those can trigger seizures in some people, and seizures can be very dangerous. So no matter how important or exciting that blog post is, please don't use flashing effects to pull someone's attention toward it. You could really injure them. And finally, we have people with cognitive disabilities. Uh, we have a large aging population that's online, people with Alzheimer's, and pe more people with conditions like Down syndrome and autism are working than ever before. So uh, supporting these communities by helping them be as self-sufficient as possible is an important goal that we should be striving toward. So how people with disabilities use the web differently? Um, the biggest one is keyboard and screen reader accessibility. Most blind people and people with motor disabilities don't use a mouse. Uh, they navigate the site by keyboard. And that means that nothing on your website should require a mouse to access or uh, interact with. This is one of your biggest accessibility wins because it covers so many diverse disabilities and is heavily needed by so many people. Usually when blind people are keyboard navigating, uh, they're also using a screen reader. So that means we'll wanna be sure we're being mindful about what will and won't be read when someone is navigating our websites, like providing descriptive text about the destination of links instead of just an image or the words click here, um, using appropriate alternative text on images to describe them, and it's important not to co-opt those accommodation tools for black hat SEO keyword stuffing. Uh, please don't just jam a lot of random keywords into that, that's really harmful for people. Um, captions and transcripts. Uh, deaf people need captions to know what's going on in videos with speech, especially when the speech is a narration of imagery. Uh, transcripts and captions are not the same thing and they serve different purposes. Um, captions happen in time with the audio, and they're primarily for deaf people, where transcripts are of, hmm? Back. That's okay. Okay, sorry. 
And transcripts are a full description of both audio and visual information provided by a video. So these are particularly useful for deafblind users who will usually translate this information into a braille re uh, reader to get the full rundown of what that video contained. We also have color and contrast. Uh, for low vision users, especially the elderly, contrast can really be key. I know light gray text on white backgrounds and these hair thin fonts uh, are so subtle and stylish and popular. Um, but they're really hard for people to see, especially people who are low vision. So to hit AA compliance, the standard is a contrast ratio of four and a half to one for normal text and three to one for large text, which is anything above 18 pixels. And finally, we have our cognitive. Um, we often think of accessibility in terms of physical accommodations, but cognitive accommodations are equally important. People with dementia and Alzheimer's benefit from websites with a predictable, constant, intuitive layout so they don't have to constantly reorient themselves from page to page. And people with intellectual disabilities or sensory processing issues like dyslexia may need more time to digest content, especially if it's complex. Using the clearest language possible and not forcing users through content at a pace beyond their control, looking at you, auto advancing homepage slider with text, is really helpful for those communities. So our need for accessibility in the Drupal community comes from three main sources. We have Drupal users, who are the end users who will build our web, or who will use our websites. And this is the group that we most frequently think of when we talk about accessibility. But that's really only a part of the picture. We also have our Drupal developers, our community members who will build websites using Drupal. And I know blind developers who love Drupal 8 because of how easy it is for them to use on the back end. Um, people with disabilities aren't just consumers of content. They're creating it, too. So an inclusive Drupal community needs to be built to include everyone who wants to use these tools, not just the easiest bodies to build for. And of course, our Drupal clients, which are the businesses and agencies that Drupal developers build websites for. One of the most pervasive excuses for skipping over accessibility on web projects is that it's an edge case. And this really has to stop, because it's not. Um, I've heard countless times that there's no budget for it on the project because there were other features that the client wanted and so accessibility was deprioritized as an edge case. And in every instance this has happened, IE testing and support has stayed on the roster. So to put it into perspective, we've got somewhere between 12.6% of all people in the US having a disability and somewhere between 3% and 8% of all people using IE. <laughs> so. Uh, why is it that as an industry we're fascinated with accounting for a browser that very few people are using but routinely ignoring or deprioritizing accessibility? At 12.6% 12 12 of the 2016 population, that brings us to an estimated 40.7 million people in the US with a disability. That's about a million more people than the entire population of California. Or, since we're in Nashville, around six times as many people as the population of Tennessee. So why do Drupal clients need accessibility? Well, we have improved access to customers, because 12.6% of the population is a lot. And we have legal safety, because being sued is bad. Uh, so we have Section 508, the WCAG 2.0, and Title III of the ADA. And the main one I want to hit here is the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, because in 2017, digital spaces became the legal responsibility of the private sector. Uh, we've had a lot of landmark lawsuits in the last few years. Uh, the federal court just ruled that Winn-Dixie's website being inaccessible violated the ADA. So there's legal precedent now for the private sector as well as public. So if you thought, oh, well, we don't have to do it because we're not under Section 508, which applies to public, um, no, now, it, now the ADA applies to you as well. So the bottom line is that Drupal's a big deal. We're estimated at a market share of about 2.2% of all websites. And even if that number doesn't seem like a big one, when you consider how many websites actually exist, it's massive. The work we're doing here matters a lot. And agencies may not always know how, or they may not make time for accessibility. So the better our core product is out of the box, the better accessibility will be for everyone. So now that I've given you a high level overview of what accessibility is and why we're doing it, I'm going to pass it off to Catherine, who will tell us about what we've done recently to make things better. Thanks, Elena. Um, so I'm Catherine from phase two. Um, as somebody who is deaf, I really appreciate when 
This is, is in companies trying to implement accessibility from the very beginning. So that's why it's so amazing to see accessibility out of the box in Drupal 8. So I'm really excited to go over some of these accessibility improvements that we have to make Drupal even more accessible. We're getting a stronger foundation that we can build upon. And so some important Drupal wins as of late are the inline form errors. Uh, if you recall previously, when there was error, it was just a message at the top of the screen. You had to figure out where the error is going to be. So these inline error forms are really useful because it actually shows you where the error is. But not only is that great, it's also added on the layer of Drupal Announce because it's going to alert the screen reader user that there's an error. Previously, when there was an error, it, the user of a screen reader wasn't immediately made aware of it. And that led to user frustration. I'm like, What's, why can't I submit this form? They couldn't find the error. So combined with Drupal Announce and the form errors, we see a lot of improvement in reducing user frustration and friction. Um, you mind me out of the box is a theme in Drupal 8, which is not quite out yet. It's still in experimental mode. But this is a great example of an accessible theme out there. It's got some great accessibility for landmarks, headings, link structures, and some um, enhancements are in the pipeline. But I'll go over some of these enhancements in a few minutes. And then we finally got this point release going right now in which we don't have to wait for a major update to see some improvement. We can see more incremental updates, which is going to really help us test out new accessibility features and see if things are responding well in the market. Um, as I mentioned, Drupal announced, I'm going to show a screen reader demo. How many of you have heard a screen reader before? Oh, oh OK, great. So this will be like, oh my gosh. And again, a screen reader experience is completely different that we as sighted people can't experience the same way as um, somebody who is blind or has low vision experiences because they're so used to it. It's like it's a part of the experience. But we should still be um, thinking about how we're going to create these experiences. So this is usually the new mommy theme. And I intentionally submitted an empty search. And so you should be hearing the Drupal announce right away. Let's see here. Oh dear, I think we're right before. Okay. Press control, option, space. Press search, but search vertical line, one, 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 two, error message. Please enter some keywords. So, Could that you? was good. Yay, Drupal announced. So what happened was right after submit, they were immediately made aware of those two error messages. Previously, it would load, and they have to go through skip to main until they found the error. So that's awesome. Um, let's see if I can go to the next slide. OK, great. So Drupal announce is still a model that you have to enable. So we're still missing the mark in Drupal core. Um, you know, there are more options and more places where we can apply Drupal 8. I'm sorry, Drupal Announce. And you know, how are we going to make, how can we help the community be made aware of this model and implement it into the model so that if there's an error, that Drupal Announce can come up and be beneficial for screen readers? Um, and do model owners even know about it? Because mm -hmm. some, that's something that we need to be um, talking more about. That's something that's going to be really useful. And so, new mommy accessibility. Um, so, we've got some menu accessibility enhancements and some menu, um, mobile menu fixes coming down. Um, primary tab theming updates is a really good experience. Heading structures and landmarks are in place. Um, I'm going to play a video of the landmarks. And so I'm going to go through all of the landmarks. I didn't do any additional coding. They did all new mommy in Drupal 8. It's a landmark, so it's pretty great. And then um, I'm going to stop it kind of abruptly um, because I have another section of the video. So just forget me if I stop in the middle. All right. No items in red menu, landmarks menu, banner. Can you hear Main it? Navigation, navigation, search. User account menu navigation. 
Main. Content info. Main. User account search. Main navigation. Navigation. You are currently in a navigation. Heading level two. Main navigation. List three items. Visited. Link. Home. One of three. Link. Articles. Two of three. You are currently on a link. Visited. Link. Recipes. Three of three. You press. Visited. Recipes for. So that is not doing anything from a content to a developer perspective. So this is really encouraging and really promising to see that this team already has these landmarks in place. And landmarks are really useful for screen readers because they give some context and a sense of place. And, have, and announcing the menu one of three, two of three, and three of three helps them with a sense of order and how big the menu is. So those are all really promising things in Umami. I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry, guys. I'll just go to the next slide. All right, great. And so we've got some color contrast ratio updates that need to be applied. Um, we don't the links. I'm seeing this more and more. And then you have like an image, the title, and a read more link. Kind of a card approach that you see a grid. And a lot of times it's three links together. So it becomes very redundant to a screen reader. And so we need to be wrapping it as one link item. So, so like bake a cookie would be one recipe link. And so I'm going to see if I can play that for you guys. No menu, landmarks. Main. All right, it's right here. Articles two of three. You are currently on a link. Visited link. You press visited in the demo web content. Main map search. Use bread crumb. You're heading level two link. Deep Mediterranean quiche. You link. View the recipe. same link. Visited link image. A white plate with a vegan chocolate brownie covered in dark vegan chocolate. You are currently on a link. To click this link, press control option space. Difficulty medium. Heading level two. Visited link. Vegan chocolate brownies. So. Those are the three of the same links. And so the screen readers can have to repeat themselves. So one of the updates that we're working on, what the community is working on, is making that one whole link. So that's just going to make a much more intuitive experience. Um, so that's great. So really exciting stuff with the theme coming up. Um, I think um, in, some, in the air measure states, having colors, icons, and text is going to be something that's going to be working on in the theme. In the layout builder, there's still a few issues with getting the layout builder to be accessible. And so still some good stuff coming up, really promising, really exciting to see all of these foundational in the community coming together to make something even more accessible out of the box. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike and give you talking about um, more of the initiatives that we're working on. Thank you, Catherine. So um, first of all, um, how many people have contributed at all to, to issues in, in Drupal accessibility over the years? OK, that's great. Um, and um, how many people here um, are, are familiar with, with uh, or have, have, have tested at all with, with accessibility of Drupal? Excellent. So that's good to see that there's that many people who've, who've looked at and evaluated this. Um, accessibility is very much a, a, a journey and not a destination. So we're never going to be able to get Drupal to a point where it's perfectly accessible. Um, so it's, it's something where we, we're going to need, keep needing your input and direction to find ways to make it better and better as, as, as we go ahead, especially as we keep adding new exciting features. Um, I've, uh, I've gone off and, and used some notation here that I think should be common in Drupal. Uh, most people will, will recognize this if you're familiar with the issue queue. Um, I'm just using the, the hashtag here um, in brackets, which will, in the Drupal issue queue, go off and give you a link to the, um, the issue. So rather than putting in the whole Drupal.org issue, I'm just providing the, the, the short form. Um, and uh, um, this is something that's, that uh, I'll just use that for a couple sli slides to go off and give, give people some reference to some, some existing issues. Um, so one of the things that, that um, we need to do and haven't yet found a, an implementation for is, is looking at uh, providing some sort of a test swarm for, uh, for Drupal accessibility. We had an early one set up on Quail 
which is a JavaScript library that was built for uh, you know kind of for Drupal you know for within the Drupal community, and it was a standalone uh, initially PHP and then JavaScript library that that uh, um, that was was developed and that was was really good, but it's it's no longer being supported. And and uh, but there's there's opportunities to go off and to to build a test suite for either Pali or Axe Core, or even with, with tools like Tenon, which are, are great tools for, for doing um, automated sort of site-wide tests. But it's, it's, it's something that, that takes people who have um, interest, experience, and background in, in developing JavaScript testing environments. And, and given the size and the complexity of Drupal, um, we need to be able to, to be able to monitor whether or not um, just basically, are errors going up or down? Are we finding this? Are we in a situation where we're with every patch that's submitted, with every build that goes out, are we finding ourselves to be more accessible or less accessible? Um, keep in mind, with any automated test, um, there you're only going to catch um, a fraction of the accessibility errors that are out there. Um, there's some really good tools out there, but they're not going to catch everything. And so, don't assume that just because it passes the the tests that you're um, your, your code is accessible. Um, likewise, don't assume that if your, um, you know, if your, if your code fails the test, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that there's an accessibility problem there either. Um, the tests are just tests. So, um, so there's, there's a, a lot of opportunity around uh, continuous integration and est establishing the, the, a stronger testing infrastructure. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the issue number, if you're looking for it, is 2857808. Um, and yeah, we, there's a, if, if anyone here wants to step up and take on uh, opportunities to go off and to, to build in more automated tests into Drupal Core, that would help uh, help moving ahead quite considerably. Um, Layout Builder was another interesting challenge that we ran into in Drupal, um, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, Layout Builder is is uh, is a, a great initiative to allow us to more dynamically uh, go in and address um, um, how pages are, are designed and how, how content is organized on a page. Um, unfortunately, it's there are no good patterns right now that are widely accepted for how to do drag and drop functionality. Um, so uh, we've we've done uh, there's an issue queue that we've uh, worked on which I oh yeah it was issue uh, two nine two zero 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 six, um, which is we needed to go off and identify what those best practices were. And um, is one of the great things about working on Drupal accessibility is that we can actually take a pioneering role in identifying and creating a best practice for for um, for 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 the web. Um, and it's it's a uh, uh, we've did that with both the um, CSS display none alternatives, which were brought in in Drupal 7. That's a really great way, and, and it's, it's, uh, um, we've seen other, um, other software projects adopt a centralized CSS uh, management for, for, um, for invisible or hidden or on-focus text, um, but, but it's, it's still something that's, that's, that not everyone knows about. Um, and it's, it's really you know, important to have these kinds of centralized functions because it allows us to, uh, to be able to be future compatible. Technology changes all the time, and if you centralize functionality like drag and drop, um, then you can, um, you can fix it. When the browsers change, when the, the uh, assistive technology is modified, when user functionality is, is adjusted, then you can update that, that, um, that pattern in one place and have that roll out across not just your site, but all of the, the, the sites that, that use that particular, uh, particular library. Um, so, um, you know, we wanted to go off and, and uh, um, make sure that the the uh, that we have a good pattern uh, in place, and and there's some some interesting uh, tools that are being built with React right now that we might be able to to use to leverage the uh, the interesting work that's being done to try and, and update the the uh, the JavaScript uh, to have a JavaScript driven backend uh, for Drupal. So again, that that could be quite uh, quite useful. Um, it's it is a bit unclear right now um, in some ways when when the Drupal um, the accessibility team identifies a problem with with the uh, um, the issues. Who's responsible for, for fixing that issue? And how to, you know the accessibility team is really quite small. We're we're, in, we're active on the uh, the Slack chat, and you'll be able to see a link to the the Slack chat. It's just the Drupal. Um, there's a, an accessibility channel in the 
um, the, the, the Drupal Slack chat, but um, there's a few of us who are engaged there, and, and uh, Andrew McPherson is, has, uh, has been, a, has been a, a real bonus having him on board because he's, he's taken on a whole other range of initiatives looking at uh, WKEG 2.1 um, and looking at, at trying to, to, to do more work on, on uh, the, the, the user testing and, and, and having, having more people look at ways that we could make Drupal better is, is, uh, um, is really important, and Andrew's taken a, a wonderful leadership role in that. We, we, we really wanted to bring him over to, to the UK, or sorry, from the UK, but couldn't couldn't justify that. Um, so so with the the, the the drag and drop functionality, uh, we have a couple patterns. We need examples of uh, we need some help uh, testing and choosing a pattern, um, and hopefully being able to to roll that out so that we have a uh, a common uh, pattern for the layout builder that we can uh, we can use across the board and and make sure that that we're we're able to. Um, to proceed with this. And, and this is actually, this is a problem that we did kind of address in Drupal 7. Um, many of you may, may have looked at the widget, the, the show high widget above tables. So if you're doing a table drag, um, I mean, that's essentially a, a kind of, of a, a drag and drop functionality, um, except that, that our solution in that case was to build a, a widget that disabled the JavaScript. Um, and uh, that kind of, that has some problems and some you know, advantages, but, but that's how we, we tried to go off and address that. Um, we need a solution right now that works for, for a two-dimensional world, so you can go off and move uh, items both left and right and up and down, uh, and know where that item is after you've moved it, whether you're using a, a keyboard or whether you're, you're using a, a tool like uh, VoiceOver or uh, NVDA, and, uh, and that's, that's definitely a challenge. Um, but we also need to be thinking ahead because at some point we may be having VR or AR integration with our websites and we might need to be able to not only go off and worry about moving it left and right but also forward and back. And what is the language and the patterns that we use to communicate about moving things around in those different dimensions. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about WKEG 2.1. Uh, this is a standard which has not been released yet, uh, but like all other standards on the web, they change and evolve over time. Um, and WKEG 2.1 is an effort to try and, and modernize and bring up to date the, um, uh, the, the, the guidelines that were set up. Uh, WKEG 2.0, although it's new to many people in the United States, that's actually a, legisla uh, that's a guideline that was, was put forward in 2008 and it's now 2018, so it's, it's more than time for us to go off and update that standard and to look at who we've missed and who we need to go off and, and uh, bring into the community. And, and uh, one of the big areas we've, we've that's being addressed for, for, for WKEG 2.1 is, um, is cognitive disabilities uh, and, uh, and things like, you know, we, we haven't done enough to try and address issues like plain language. How do we make sure that, that we're communicating to people in, in a way that they can understand, particularly in a very busy, hectic uh, world that we are all living in? Um, area is another one, um, and we've implemented some area in, uh, in Drupal, well, we, we implemented very little in Drupal 7, we implemented quite a lot in Drupal 8, uh, but these standards are evolving over time as well, and uh, uh, we need to go off and make sure that we've implemented the correct way, and that we're not, that we're appropriately labeling the, the, uh, um, uh, our, our, uh, our templates as well as the functional elements of our, our site, uh, and are able to keep up with, with the best practices of, of the web. Um, there's some amazing opportunities to try and insert accessibility into, uh, into all kinds of things. Um, you know, many of us are still at the, at the, the stage of looking to have about how to go off and migrate uh, information over into, uh, into, you know, from a Drupal 6 or Drupal 7 website into Drupal 8. Um, wouldn't it be great in the, the process of migrating your site over that, that you were able to clean up the old you know, HTML4 for, for code, be able to bring that up to a, a modern standard for a, for a modern responsive website, that you're able to strip out all the font tags, you're able to, to verify which, which of the pages you're migrating over have, are missing alt text and, and might have uh, broken links and, and other things that are a problem for, for, the, for, for the user with the migrated content. Shouldn't it be, wouldn't it be good if we could try and do that as opposed to leaving this as this nasty problem? Well. We could look at this. We could build this into to the migrate module and find ways that we're we're able to test user content as it's being brought in, um, and make sure that 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 especially at these big these big pain points for organizations, that we're able to to help them adopt best practices going forward. Um, uh, the media module is another one where where um, where things were um, it wasn't a concern in in Drupal uh, 8.0 to to have a um, 
to, to, to look at, at the, 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 uh, a lot of the, 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 um, the structure of it. Uh, actually, just to mention, we, we, we've tried to go off and, and look at the, uh, incorporate ATAG uh, concepts into Drupal, uh, Drupal 8. ATAG is the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines, which for, especially for any um, institution like a university or a government agency, ATAG it seems like it's a, a really wonderful way to go off and save a hell of a lot of money and resources if you can improve the authoring interface so that it's easier for authors to produce more accessible content by default, then you will save money. It's just, it's a no-brainer, but nobody wants to invest in that and, and find ways to, to, to make sure that that content is, is um, yeah, it, it, that they're helping their authors out as much as they can and using the tools and the technology to be able to help their authors produce the best content possible. Um, but now that we've got the, the media module um, into, actually as of 8.4, well, we, we need to be thinking about how to go off and, and um, think about ways to make sure, make sure that, the, that we're, we're, we're addressing uh, you know, images and videos more effectively in, in the authoring process. Um, and with uh, Umami, uh, again, it's, 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 uh, there's a lot more that can be done um, where, uh, you know, especially as, as content is being added to the site. I find that, that the, uh, it, it's, it's great to have this demo um, site out there and, and uh, it's, it's amazing that, that uh, um, people like Carrie have gone, gone so far to go off and make the alt tag tags not only there but actually tasty. Like, you know, if you look at the, the alt tags, you know, if you're reading the alt tags, you should feel as hungry looking, reading the alt text as you are looking at the images. And it was wonderful to go off and to see the, um, the, the the alt text, uh, or sorry, to, to, to talk about uh, the, the initial story of, of Umami and how that was, was uh, you know, how the, the making of, of the, the, the photos for Umami is as part of the, the, the keynote this morning. And, uh, and again, if we can try and take some of that, that passion that went into to, uh, to making these images and finding ways to actually make it also accessible so that everyone wants to go off and have a, you know, a cookie or a brownie or that <laughs> delicious soup, so, you know. Um, so there's, there's a number of, of strategic initiatives that are being um, set forth by the, the Drupal, uh, Drupal core team. Um, the theme component library um, and the, uh, we've got the JavaScript moderniz modernization movement. Um, there's issues around the experimental uh, admin UI, uh, the outside in um, 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 process and, and each of these, like th there are accessibility elements in all of them and they need to be tested and evaluated and the accessibility team is really quite small, and we might have the ability to go off and to jump up and take, take, be involved in some of these things, but we need really to have more people looking at these um, and finding ways to, to evaluate them with tools like the Wave Toolbar, with, uh, with Tenon, with color contrast tools. Like, there's a lot of the stuff can be tested quite easily with automated tools, and you don't need to be an accessibility mm -hmm. expert in order to, to do them. If you see a red flag, then, then you know, if you see something, say something, something like that. You know? like we, can, we can have people participate in the issue queue. We can find people to participate with, with creating patches. And some of these things are very easy to evaluate. Um, there's harder things as well that, that do need some, some experience, but, but so much can be done by just, you know, can you tab through the interface? Can, do the, when you're building a test, can you, can you evaluate whether or not it meets um, if, if the wave, wave toolbar or, or the uh, axe core, do they produce any errors that you're, you're identifying? If we can have that testing being done by other people in the community, it helps a whole lot. Um, and we can always use more people in the, uh, the Drupal accessibility team as well. So um, sign, jump up and, and can, you know, join the Slack group and find ways to, uh, to get involved. Uh, and now... <laughs> I can speak more about Excellent. that, yeah. Um, this is the part, uh, as Mike said, that like I, I've been working with accessibility for a few years now, and I've I've written things and I've done testing and had clients and built this like cool like accessibility component library, and I got to do a lot of fun things. But I and I've been in the Drupal community since 2005, but I had never contributed to the code base until this year and a couple months ago actually, um, with the help of my company Hook42 and Amy June that works there. And um, it just happened to be Umami, which everyone's talking about, and it's very exciting. Um, and I got to do some things that, you know, even though with all the, the stuff that I've done with accessibility, I literally wrote text to describe an image. And so it's not, 
that you have to be this person. You can be the person that, you know, wants to describe what a brownie looks like on a plate, you know, and you can still be a core contributor to Drupal. And, you know, that's kind of sad that that's like my core credits, but I did a few other things, but uh, yeah. So don't, don't think of this as like a, a huge uh, accessibility issue, but there are some challenges and we're gonna kind of talk about some of the things that um, people do are, are worried about. Um, so, again, if you think, okay, I'm a beginner to accessibility, and how can I contribute? You know, I'm just interested in the topic. Um, but that's great, because that's where we all started from. We all started with just an interest and a drive. And so it could be that you just check the color contrast and verify that, you know, that code, you know, is correct. You know, it's just like all these little tiny things that add up. Um, but speaking of automated testing, they're really only catching right now about 20 to 40% on a good day. Um, and all the different tools that are out there for uh, automated testing, um, some are better at some things and some things are, are better at others. And I'm actually excited about the day when we're gonna catch you know, 80, maybe 90. I'll never say 100. There, I feel like we'll never get to 100, but maybe, maybe I'll prove me wrong, please. But. Um, so that's a challenge because if you, you know, if you're only running automated testing, you're only going to catch, let's say, 40%. So then you can go on to manual accessibility testing, which includes things like uh, using keyboard navigation to tab through a page or using assistive technology devices um, to see where the errors are. Um, but it can take a long time and can be difficult. And it is also one of those things that you kind of have to practice a little bit before you can feel like really confident in, in what the problem is and how to address it. Um, and then on top of all of that, uh, we have this accessibility as a moving target. So we're talking about the WCAG 2.0s that we're on right now, 2.1s are coming out in June. You got all the other A tags and you've got the ADA and you've got all these laws and regulations. Um, and then you have browsers, right? Browsers are not stagnant. They keep evolving and changing and introducing little fun bugs and you know things that we have to squish. Um, assistive technologies themselves also change and versions matter. And one assistive technology on, you know, I don't know, Chrome version, whatever, is going to be different possibly on Safari version, whatever. So it's not even like there's consistent bugs that you're seeing also. And then users, we're all unique people and we all have our unique abilities and limitations. And so these are a lot of challenges, but I'm gonna make you feel maybe a little bit happier and give you some of the uh, why you should help. So we talked about some of the things um, that we're doing in Drupal 8, some of the things that we wanna do in the future, um, but why should you help, right? If you're an organization, there's a lot of different reasons, like saving time and money, it's the law, that sort of great stuff. Um, as an agency in themselves, as a leader, you want to attract these employees, you wanna attract clients. Um, think of it as, you know, if we're talking about one billion people in the world who have identified as having a disability, that's a large percentage of potential customers that you could have. So the, if, you know, if you kind of switch it around a little bit, it, it helps, you know, bring in the money and the, the time and the effort. Um, and then the community, if we can develop skills and we have a great team, we can gr get together. As individuals, you can grow as well. So there's a lot of really great reasons of why you should help. So we'll get to the how, and we'll go through a little faster so we can have time for questions. But how can you help? Um, so again, going to events like this, going to sessions like this, that's great. Checking the Drupal.org um, issue queue. Um, if you're an agency or an organization, give your volunteers or your employees some time to do this. Um, maybe a little bit of extra research time or um, l allowing them to go to a conference or a local meetup. There's a lot of great things. Uh, the community, also, it's one of those community, you have to be a good community source as a person uh, wanting to learn, but then you also have to have the people who will step up and teach. And I may not be an expert at you know the latest, I don't know, back end, whatever, but then I know that this person knows this, so we can put our skills together, accessibility and front end, and then their back end skills, and we can talk about like how can we make a solution that's holistic. So I think it's, it takes all of us. So a couple of ways we've, we've all talked today about code. We've talked a lot about code. Um, so like Umami updates, JavaScript, 
uh, workspace experimental modules. There's a lot of things. You can easily find issue cues with the accessibility tag. But beyond that, there's so much more that people can do, too. And I feel like that part gets really lost, especially at tech conferences. But documentation, documentation, documentation. Um, you may not know everything, but you can start to write about it, or, and you get into it, and you get to deep you know, thinking. Um, Mike Gifford, myself, Andrew McPherson, we all have access to the Drupal.org documentation module or pages. So if you get in there and you've seen this and you say, oh, you know, Mike, we're missing this section, or Carrie, I think you need to change this or edit this page. Um, you can either send that to us directly or you can um, you know, edit the node and then we can just submit it and then we can press OK and basically pub publish your changes. But if we're not doing it, we also want you guys to do it. So it's a team effort. Um, so these other ones too, connections and meeting up. We have this uh, Drupal, uh, Drupal, Drupal? <laughs> a Drupal group, um, and we have a monthly accessibility meetup. So it's virtual. You don't, you can do it in your pajamas and you know whatever, whatever time it is you're in your time zone. Um, we have the ash, hashtag Ally Talks, and every month what we get is we get an expert from the accessibility community to come in and talk about a various topic. So we've had things about documentation. We've had people come in and talk about JavaScript. We've had people who come in, like even Helena was on a, a panel where we talked about like how we use Drupal and how we use accessibility in our daily lives at work and, and what it means to us. And so there's a lot of like different topics and a lot of things to learn. So you may not like you know this month's challenge or this month's uh, topic, but then the next month it switches. And all of that is recorded to on the YouTube channel. Um, and connections. So besides Drupal, um, there's this crazy big world out there, accessibility world. And internationally, it is huge. Like Canada and Europe especially are like, I hate to say that, but they're light years ahead of us, mm -hmm. right? And they've been doing it a little bit longer. They may have slightly different laws or rules. But I mean, if we're talking about WCAG 2.0, that's international standards. So there's a lot you can learn from people who've already done it as well. You know, if you do want to have people to look up to that have been doing it for 20, 30 years, I'm not quite there yet. I don't, maybe Mike is there yet, but um, the rest of us have a few more years to catch up to, uh, to Europe. But um, besides that, there's the W3 Slack channel. So if you want to get outside the Drupal Island, that's a great place. I love it. There's so many really wonderful people there. Twitter, company blogs, tasks, writing projects, just it's all over there. And if you need help, look, we have resources. <laughs> so I won't read all of these because we don't have time, but if we'll keep these, the slide deck will be on this um, presentation and so you can come back and reference it. But some of the things that we talked about today, if you wanna get in a little bit deeper about those. Um, accessibility statements, these are all the Drupal ones. This is the documentation I was talking about earlier. And then some of the, the groups. So the Drupal Slack, W3C, and then you have these other uh, meetup groups. Um, I threw up my style guide in case you're a front end developer and you care about that. Um, but also this accessibility people and company list, this is just on GitHub. And it's got a great list of people and companies that are contributing to the accessibility worldwide, the cause. And so they are a wealth of information. So. so that's about it. Oh, I'm gonna read this real quick. This is one of our favorite quotes. Uh, collectively, because I chose it, but um, <laughs> the power of the web in, is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. And this is Tim Berners-Lee, which is the W3C director and inventor of the World Wide Web. So it's, it's important, and even from the very, very beginning, um, they knew that that was something that was very important and equalizing for all of us. So. Thank you guys, that's our formal presentation. Now if you have any more, if you have any questions, this would be a time. Oh, and go to the mic if you can. My name is Jason Woodbury, I work for the state of Tennessee. Do you have any uh, government website or case studies or examples to point to? Are you familiar with 18F? Um, the 18F? 18F. 18F. One eight. Yeah, they've got some good accessibility resources from the government, and um, if you come up, I can give you the URL for it. And they have some neat um, federal government accessibility practices, how tos for specifically Section 508. 
Yeah, uh, there's um, mass.gov. I don't know if people have mentioned that one. And there's the UK one. Do you re is that the one you're going to mention? Yeah, the, the gov government digital services in the UK has got some wonderful resources, and it's, it's a great place to look at. And they're also leading the open government initiative in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. So if you're looking for, for open and accessible, like the, the UK is a great example internationally. Yes. Uh, anything that, oh, there goes my phone. Um, <laughs> yeah, people who get motion sickness, I mean, people come in all stripes, so, you know, what impacts one person may not impact another. But uh, videos that have a lot of motion when the person is not moving, anything that can make you feel like you're moving, like a video out the window of a car or, you know, out of the window of an elevator, things like that can cause, can cause motion sickness for people. Okay. Um, my second question. Uh, I know there has been, has there been any thought of, about fixing uh, or perhaps adding or even creating a new version of the accessibility module that I know exists yeah. for Drupal 7 or 8 um, and then adding that to core? And the reason why I ask is um, where I work, we do use the WYSIWYG model, mm -hmm. the module, excuse me, and CK Editor, I know is now a part of uh, Drupal 8. Um, the accessibility module, in theory, when it works correctly, <laughs> I know you need about three or four patches in order to get it to work correctly, um, does work for developers who are developing towards the site, mm -hmm. and it allows user, or those who are developing um, a site using the accessible, uh, using the site to actually keep notes in order to explain how or explain what those tests are. Uh, has there been any thoughts about that at all? So, um, two responses to that one. Um, one <laughs> is the, too. there's the, um, there's the CK Editor Accessibility Plugin, which I'm not sure that, if, is that the one you're referring to? No, there's an actual. Yeah, there's an older module for Drupal 7, older, yeah. 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 Uh, the the quail is is no longer supported. Nobody's touching quail. So so that's a real problem for both the the, uh, the 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 accessibility module that Kevin had set up initially that was using quail to go off and to do those tests. Um, but it's also a problem for the CK editor accessibility plugin that some people are are building in because because it, be, because they're running JavaScript on their mm -hmm. site in a, an unsupported JavaScript library in their site. And yeah. what are the security implications of just leaving another unsupported JavaScript library in your site? It, it may be nothing, but I don't recommend it for any of my clients, and I wouldn't mm -hmm. recommend it for anyone else. Um, so, you know, in terms of upgrading the the uh, the Drupal module that, that helped test the the, the development um, of the development environment to, to test the the site itself, um, there haven't been any efforts to try and, and upgrade that that I'm aware of, and, and partly it's trying to go off and get to 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 finding a way to go off and to, to incorporate Axe Core or Pally mm -hmm. or um, there is a Tenon module that you can you can download for your site that that will plug in and I think there's both the Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 version of that. That's probably the closest that that we have for that style of, of uh, Drupal module to provide accessibility evaluations. Um, but but hopefully that will change and, and uh, especially I mean the. The Chrome um, toolbar that's that's uh, the Lighthouse tool, uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, developer tools that in involves a an accessibility component that a lot of people don't know about. So that actually will test your page using Axe Core to go off and to evaluate uh, it for for basic accessibility too. And, and most of your developers will probably have that Chrome developer uh, toolkit enabled and, and using it all the time. So convincing them to go off and to use the mm -hmm. the the Lighthouse. Um, d Web accessibility tool is probably an easy an easy sell. Do you know if any of those tools offer feedback for content editors? Which is kind of what was the draw when I initially saw that module, the accessibility accessibility module, which 
We're not using it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but do you know any of those tools to get off of that? There, I don't think so. There is a tool, though, that can check your, your I have to, I'll send you a link or something, but it has, um, it will test your content for uh, obvious accessibility errors and like the reading level and whether or not, you know, it's got all these like little facets and stuff. And um, a pres actually one of the presenters at um, one of our monthly meetups is the one who told us all about it. But um, it's not, it's like an external tool. And I think that's maybe the reason why people haven't updated the accessibility tool inside of Drupal is there are all these great, very nuanced, great tools out there already that can do some of these very specific things and with great reliability that maybe they haven't wanted to do that. But we can, I can get you a link for that particular one if you're talking about content specific, but. There's another um, one with, by the Khan Academy, it's called Tota 11Y, totally. Yeah. And um, it, you can put on Drupal, but you can also have it at the Chrome plugin. And the cool thing about it is it checks um, all of the front page stuff. Like, so that could be for the content editor stuff. So what it does is it'll scan it and it'll say, oops, there's error, consider doing X. So it not only tells you what's wrong, like how to fix it. So it's pretty cool for like headings. Like, hey, you skip the heading, make this a heading four or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, bullet list and that kind of thing. So it's totally T O T A 11 Y. Thank you. Another good one for that is Wave Tool. And that also will do the same thing. It'll tell you what's wrong, but it'll also tell you why it's wrong and explain how to fix it. And then there's another tab on it for outline. And it'll give you an outline of the page structure so that you can make sure that all of your headings are or nested semantically. Yeah, but that's almost like a difference because it's markup versus like actual content. You know what I mean? Like yeah, but it's check. I mean, yeah. it's not until they have put it up, but yeah. once they've put it up, they can see if that's I used true. headings properly or am I using them for decoration, things like that. A, there's a tool for everything. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I was actually going to bring up the Lighthouse because I was going to. Uh, did you talk? I came in like 10 minutes late. Did you talk about that? Or no? I didn't talk about it, just in the questions. I don't think I mentioned Lighthouse prior. Okay, but. yeah, because I was going to ask on the scale of 0 to 40%, where do you think that hmm. lands in terms of coverage? I, I'm, I'm guessing that it's somewhere around 25%. There was okay. the, the, the closest evaluation that I've seen of this recently was, was the, the UK government did a, mm -hmm. uh, an assessment of, of these various tools and they created a dummy page that had, had a number of accessibility problems with it and said, mm -hmm. you know, they tested these tools and including ones like Site Improve and, and looked at, at how, to, how, how they did. And uh, I don't have the numbers offhand, but if you search for the, the UK government accessibility, you know, um, uh, tool check, checklist, or, or a survey, they, you, you'll, you'll be able to find that. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, it's a, this really great uh, page where everything's like broken. <laughs> and you can see how well your tool is. Is that the same thing as the CP Accessibility? Oh, so this is what, I put, I put this slide back up because we have the contributed accessibility modules for D8. And those are the ones that have been um, deemed as access tagged with accessibility. And then there's notes like the one with the Quail JS um, and being a security issue. So that might be a good I was, reference I was for. Just mentioning that the CP editor accessibility tracker module says that it's going to be added to the platform. Um, Can you repeat it? Because oh, sorry. So the, the, um, there's an issue to try and add the CK uh, editor accessibility plugin to Core. Um, but that is uh, postponed, and because the parent project, CK Editor, is, uh, they have to go off and fix the, 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 the um, they have to swap out Quail mm -hmm. for Axe Core or Pally in order, before that can take place. So until CK Editor fixes that problem, we aren't going to be upgrading that in, in Core. Okay. Thank you. I think I saw a question over there. So I'm curious, um, you know, I've been through some of the documentation that's on D.O., which is really nice and super clear, and I really appreciate the references to WCAG and everything. Um, so thank you so much uh, for everyone who's contributing that. I'm curious though, because like, one of the things that's really annoying whenever you're writing um, or a few responses is you'll get a new ad requirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stuff you have to address and there's a lot of things you have to go through 
conversion models and just sweating blood. Um, but I mean, how do you now how do you generate that? I'm kind of wondering if there would be a place on Udapo or somewhere else that would be appropriate for a community-led like, response for Drupal, and where do you guys think that would feel best? It's um, a good question. So it is. Um, first of all, I do have a, um, a GitHub uh, page that references best practices for uh, accessibility procurement. And I think that, that this is a big part of it because a lot of, um, a lot of organizations say, you know, um, must meet WCAG 2.0 AA, and that's the bullet point that they list in the site. And, and that's a best case scenario. I saw one from a municipal, or, a municipal organization that said WCRG 2.0 AA is like they got the acronym mm -hmm. wrong. So like, well, what is the legal implications for an, for an RFP response that didn't get the acronym, acronym right for this? <laughs> Yeah, exactly, and, and, and you can do that, but you just don't have the budget for it. Like there's, you know, you have to add a zero or two at the end of your, your, your in order to go off and meet that AAA compliance. Um, but the, but in terms of VPATs, I mean, VPATs have been reformed recently, so they're better now. Um, it's still problematic um, because the VPATs don't actually require um, a third party evaluation to see that this is, that this is anything more than a sales job. Mm -hmm. And nobody in the Drupal Association or nobody in the accessibility team is, has been interested in pursuing the extensive sales piece that needs mm -hmm. to happen in order to go off and to fill in the VPAT in order to make claims and assertions that may or may not be true um, in order to go off and make this a valuable document for procurement purposes. Because it's... Um, what is VPAT? Oh, it's the uh, voluntary, voluntary accessibility... Yeah. Yes. Something or other voluntary. It's, it's a government. It's a government. It's a U.S. government accessibility procurement loophole, or not? Or they, they put up so that, that they can go off and, and put onto vendors. You know, is your 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 site accessible? If it, if it, you've got a VPAT statement, then we've covered our ass, and we can make sure that that we've we've gone off and, and done our due diligence because they have a VPAT statement. Therefore, the accessibility problems aren't aren't our fault. I think that's it too. Like why people don't want to touch it is because of the legal implications and and the liability. So I. You know what I mean? I'm sure you can find something open source or free on the web, but I'm not really sure how specific that is to your organization yeah, or company. There's, there's nothing specific for people yeah. to Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. So what I'm hearing is that we need some way to put something out there that would be a good starting point. It's like an office test. Hurt, but it covers. You could add it to our documentation if you want to help write it. I would think so. I mean, if we could put something like a, a template or something. Of so, yeah, I mean, if you, if you wanted to go off and put up a, a Google Doc or a, a GitHub uh, page mm -hmm. to go yeah. off and to start this, I'd be happy to promote it. And if you're able to take the lead on this and trying to build something that's a, a credible VPAT statement mm -hmm. that allows Drupal to have a leg up over others, um, and it would be interesting to go off mm -hmm. and to see, well, what have, what has the WordPress community done? Do they have anything? Mm -hmm. What have, have any other open source community done? Generally, what, what was being done for the U.S. government to say, okay, well, it was it was accessible enough for the White House. It's not anymore because they've switched to WordPress, but uh, and it's accessible enough for for so many other lead government agencies that it's it's accessible enough and it doesn't really require a VPAT. So, um, but that may not count in this day and age. So, we promise to adhere to WordCag 4.0. <laughs> Level CCC. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. If there's no more questions, uh, there's a couple more um, accessibility th opportunities. There's a boff right after this. If you have very specific questions or you want to talk about any things that we talked about today in more in depth, and then tomorrow, uh, I guess tomorrow's Wednesday, right? The accessible editor. And then also a smarter way to test accessibility. Those are both coming up tomorrow. So. And, and we'll have these slides. We'll, we'll tweet about them. And uh, um, we'll, how we tweet about them? On just I don't know. Alley. We'll send them a link or yeah, something. Yeah, something like yeah. that. So we can put, post up something and, and retweet that. So take, take uh, an eye out for that. All right. Thank you, guys. One more thing. We are also going to have a little like open Q&A at the Lullabot yeah. booth tomorrow. So if anybody has a question that they didn't think of today and they want to swing by, um, I don't know when it is, but I will tweet it. Ooh. And I'll hashtag it DrupalCon so that you guys can find it. There you go, perfect. Thank you.
Oh, yeah. 